Welcome to the Radical Brilliance Podcast with Arjuna Arda and brilliant guests from around the world who are contributing to the evolution of humanity. Today's guest is Joe McClinsky, who's going to talk to us about how disruption breeds evolution. So here's your host, Arjuna Arda. Hey there. Today's episode of the Radical Brilliance podcast is with Joe Machinsky, who is the author of the book Shift the Work and the founder of a company in Baltimore called Shift, which supports businesses, organizations, from a few dozen to a few hundred to a few thousand employees, particularly to navigate times of challenge and change. Now, businesses anyway go through turbulent times for all sorts of reasons. Industries change. But this podcast is recorded while we're still in the lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic. If we look previously at times like this, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, even 9-11, times of great disruption and hardship where people suffer and there is death are also times of tremendous evolution, innovation and opportunity. But you need to understand the mechanics of how to see disruption and unwanted hardship as something you can surf for a more positive future. And that's certainly going to be the case with this pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, we were in a time of great economic booming. People were traveling a lot, going to restaurants, partying. There was plenty for everybody, very low unemployment. During the pandemic, all that has dramatically changed. But after this pandemic, new things will emerge what we could call emerging values, emergent values, things that we had not really even considered as valid before. And whoever is able to put themselves in a mindset to be able to ride that wave is going to thrive, not only financially, uh, which is obviously one of the, one of the paradigms we think about with, with business, but also be able to thrive in terms of a meaningful life and innovation and contribution. Joe McClinsky is an expert in, ha- in how to develop this mindset in a business environment, particularly to be able to thrive in difficult times. So please enjoy this conversation with Joe McClinsky. Hey, welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased to, uh, to welcome my good friend and a little bit like role model hero, Joe Machinsky, who's got some amazing things to share. Joe is the author of the book, Shift the Work, and the founder of a company called Shift in Baltimore that consults with all sizes of businesses, particularly to help them evolve through times of challenge and adversity. So let's start, Joe, with a a little report from the trenches. You know, we've been a couple of months now into this pandemic, what what impact have you been noticing it's had on your clients so far? Yeah, Arjuna, thank you for asking that and for having me on today um, because I do feel like we're in in the trenches and on the front line. And I think, you know, this has been kind of a humbling moment for all of us, uh, a bit sobering depending on, you know, how this has impacted you personally from a health perspective. But from a business standpoint, I can tell you that we are watching people go through the five stages of grief uh, into, you know, really letting go of what happened yesterday. Um, Because a lot of the things that, you know, we like as human beings is we like the things that are familiar and things are now very unfamiliar to us. And the more that things become unfamiliar and uncertain, people are, you know, have a little bit of a tough go. And, you know, some of the organizations that we're seeing do the things that we believe, you know, will help advance humanity, like, you know, have their employees' backs and their clients' backs and take the long view. Those things are positive proof points that this is going to be a good thing for us long term. But there's also lots of organizations who, you know, are saying things like, I can't wait to go back to normal. 
Like I can't wait until things open back up. And this, this concept of back is I think the thing you and I've been riffing about recently, which is, you know, there is no back. Right. Um, there is only forward. So um, those are just some of the things that we're seeing right now. So let's riff on that a little bit more together with, with our friends live with us too. So really any, any big transition, we could define it in a before, a during and an after, right? So that would be true of a big war. It's true of previous pandemics. It's true of 9-11. There's what life was like before, what life's like during, what life's like after. And I think we know a lot about before in this case. We know that we had a fairly booming economy. People were traveling a lot, going to restaurants, whoopee. You know, there was a lot of, lot of innovation. There was a, a reasonable amount of, of liquid money available to fund new ventures, uh, particularly where I, where, near where I live in Silicon Valley. Uh, the during we know about as well. You know, we've been, we've been halted in our steps. It's been great news for the environment, right? <laughs> great news for planet Earth. There's been a lot less impact. But uh, a lot of, almost everything we were used to doing has changed. Um, people are not gathering together for conferences and people are, not, um, people are not able to travel. And to some degree, business continues, but in many ways it doesn't. Many businesses can't continue at all because they relied upon customer contact. So what can we, what can we begin, based on the before, the before and the during, what can we intelligently start to see we're not going back to? And, and how does that create a vacuum in which we can, you know, potentially see opportunities for evolution? Yeah. Another really big question. And, you know, the way I would start to unpack that a little bit is, you know, the, the frame that you use around what was true before, right? So, you know, I think about just personally, I haven't had a haircut in seven weeks. <laughs> um, the kids have been home for seven weeks with homeschooling. Uh, we're cooking more as a family because of all the shutdowns. Um, we're not traveling. We're not commuting. We're not looking for, you know, sort of our normal distractions that we were just from a personal perspective. And, and I can even comment that from a business standpoint that, you know, more or less, I think people are asking, you know, what's really important? What's really necessary? What's really essential? That word's been thrown around in the media right, a lot right now, which is, you know, what are the things that are absolutely a must moving forward? And, you know, in a lot of ways, this during COVID-19, this period is, is like a pressure cooker. It's giving us a chance to, to sort of burn off what's not essential, what's not necessary. And I think one of the things that people, you know, are starting to get to, which is like, what is enough? Like enough time, enough money, enough resources. Like, do I really need to get a haircut every other week, given that I'm like losing my hair here? Or, you know, what are the things that are going to help me feel better? And organizations, you know, I think are also starting to experience like all the things that they wouldn't have done before this. Like they, so many organizations for the last 20 years that we've been working with, you know, they, they had been afraid to give more agency to their employees because they, you know, they have this weird parent and child relationship with their people. Like, it's like, well, I can't trust you to not show up at a certain time so that work still happens. I can't trust that if you're not at a physical location that work still won't happen. Well, you know, we sort of were thrust. That's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you cheat, treat your employees like children, they start to behave like children. They start acting like children. And, and frankly, you know, we were thrusted into this, the largest social experiment that's ever happened to humanity which was this lockdown and this sequester, this, this quarantine. And so now what you're starting to see just through, you know, they say, you know, constraints and, you know, necessity is the mother of all inventions. And so what organizations are starting to see is maybe these notions we had before around how we did business, how we did work can be different. And that, I think that's the, 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 the amazing opportunity that we have moving forward here is to really, as you've been helping me even think about what's possible and what's next. Right, right, right. I know a really, we can shine a spotlight on this because th these things um, are kind of inspiring in, 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 in big picture, but they get, they get really focused when we zoom in on an example. So I know you had a, an all company meeting quite recently, yep. uh, which was, as I think you told me it was the first all company meeting you had done virtually. Yeah. And, that, and you, you, you told me there were some really significant differences in an, what I saw, what I heard from you was in an attempt to recreate what you were used to, in an attempt to recreate the, the results you were used to getting, actually 
emergent values showed up. So new, new benefits of a meeting emerged when you were forced to do it remotely. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what you learned out of that all company meeting. Well, look, I think most leaders right now are trying to just gather their people in a place where they can sort of create a new set point, you know, a new, a new sort of place where everybody feels connected in this socially distant environment. And, you know, most, I think, organizations are putting themselves in a bit of a double bind saying, should I do the meeting or should I cancel it? And so when you're putting yourself in these sort of binds between, well, should I do the meeting or maybe we should just make the meeting less time because how can we possibly recreate a gathering where people feel like they know, own, and drive the most important priorities? And so what we did was we sort of took a step back and said, well, let's pretend for a second we're going to do this meeting, but we're going to do this meeting and try to make this experience better than what it would be offline, better than what it would be in person. And so for the last 20 years, you know, we've been running meetings for people, for ourselves. I mean, we've got a team spread out all over the country. Um, but you're right. This was really the first time that we said the default is going to be virtual. The default mm. is going to be remote. Mm. And, you know, part of what we, you know, had to really it almost forced our focus to lessen the agenda, to increase the breaks, mm. to really think about the architecture of the meeting. And, and again, you and I can double click on a couple of these things like, you know, the, the idea that we're all doing this from the house, right? Mm -hmm. This is the first time that you, I'm getting a chance to see everyone's house. And, mm -hmm. you know, we sort of had everyone give us a little virtual tour for a second so that, mm -hmm. you know, we know this, which is the, it's like the work and professionalism are, are these words that we use to describe, you know, more or less this mask or costume that we put on every day with each other. Like we're not being real humans because we've got to be professional. And so exactly. the fact that my kids are going to walk in here at any point in time today for our Facebook live or my dogs, hmm. now you get a chance to benefit from Joe, the dad and Joe, the husband and Joe, yes. whatever else, you know, right. the other hats that I wear here. And that was exactly. the first thing that we noticed, which was the fact that we really were getting more of who people are Brilliant. than ever before. Right. Right. That's a, that's an amazing point. And of course, if you meet someone in their own environment, they, they were the one that decided the art on the walls, right? right? It was them who, it's them who decides how to feed the dog. So everything in their environment is a, is a result of their authority, of their authoring their life. But much of that is stripped away when we enter into the old work environment. When you're entering into an environment architected by somebody else where the, 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 the way we go about the day is architected by somebody else. And we even talked about the food you eat is provided by somebody else. Yeah. You strip people of their capacity to author their contribution, and then we get less of them. So this is actually, in this way, what appeared to be uh, a, a, a challenge, what appeared to be a difficult time, has actually ended up being an evolutionary leap, and hopefully one we won't need to go back from. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Well, and look, I think one of the things that people may not have thought would happen is, you know, how many people are going to really want to go back to that fake office where work doesn't really happen, that it's a game, you know, it's a game of looking good as opposed to being good. It's a, mm. it's a game that, that, that doesn't necessarily incentivize true honesty because a lot of games are set up to win or lose. And so one of the things that we're starting to see is, we're trying to help hold this record of learnings and lessons. We're trying to sort of capture through not just surveys, but also asking people to be sincerely reflective because as things do open back up, the question is, you know, how do we take with us all of these moments and extend these moments to something even better? And look, I mean, at a, at a cursory level, every organization that has a long-term commercial lease is got to be rethinking it right now. You know, every organization that is thinking about, again, the way that they assemble and gather people. I mean, I can tell you a couple of our clients, you know, billion dollar companies, you know, one of them just, you know, saved over $20 million so far this year of travel and entertainment costs. Because guess what? Business is still happening. They're still doing work with their customers. And, and, and again, like these old ideas that I've got to be in front of the customer in order for them to say, yes, we've had six weeks to, to give us other data. And it's right. almost like we're, we're all these iPhones, right? We need a new software update to like new thinking, better thinking, potentially, again, a more beautiful way of living. 
I think this ties into other conversations you and I have had already about the, the way that the marketplace that used to be one part of a small town or a village that was active maybe one day a week, that was market day. The marketplace has in recent years, particularly with the technology, in, um, with the, um, technology revolution, it started somewhat with the industrial revolution, but really was impacted by technology. But now we've got a marketplace that's running 24-7. Yeah. And we've talked a little bit, the impact of that is not just that the, that the store is never closed, but really everything becomes fodder for the marketplace. If you have a realization of God, God speaks to you in a dream, you're full of divine grace. Now, if you want people to know about that, you've got to market it, right? That didn't used to happen. When the, when the marketplace was in one part of the village, and the church was in another part of the monastery or something, those things were kept separate. So it used to be that life was only transactional at a certain location on a certain day. Now everything's transactional. But one of the things we've noticed out of this pandemic is that uh, people are being stripped of their makeup. You know, I, I don't know if, if you ever get a chance to look at any sort of late night TV. You know, there's, I, I enjoy Saturday Night Live. I find it kind of amusing. And there's a there's a bunch of you know, late night TV hosts now working from home, as you said, with their dog wandering in and out, their kids wandering in and out. Uh, so we're, we're suddenly seeing people that used to be very polished, stepping onto a stage to big applause, wearing a nice suit at home. And actually the responsiveness to many of these TV hosts has, has gone up. Now they're human beings. Uh, right. So it may be that the, this, this shift that's occurred of, of us being forced to stay home for a while is going to cause us to dramatically rethink the way we approach marketing, where authenticity, long last, authenticity may be valued over glitter. What, what are your thoughts there? Well, look, I think, again, um, you and I talked uh, about this before. Uh, Richard Saul Werman, the founder of TED, has this whole um, bit about you know, the difference between being good and looking good. And I love it because I, I think this is sort of the crossroads we find ourselves in, which is, I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed massively wearing pants without buttons for the last seven weeks. I mean, I, I actually- You're actually of, wearing pants right now? I am wearing pants. In fact, I wore <laughs> pants today with buttons <laughs> just for you. Um, but, but again, that, that notion of dressing up, up implies I'm down, mm. up implies I'm, I'm missing something. There's a deficit of sorts. And I think, again, when you think about a million dollar TV studio, to give this illusion that everything's perfect and pristine, mm. I think this is the bubble bursting moment that we all needed, which was the, 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 you know, the bubble of what I should be going for. Like, no offense to Kim Kardashian, but she's probably not the role model first when we've got all of these other heroes that we can point to. And, and you and I talked a lot about this too, which is I'm really excited that this moment is going to provide ample opportunity for us to maybe reconfigure what we thought a hero was. Mm. Because we don't, you know, no, again, disrespect to the armed services and our military who keep us safe, you know, from foreign invaders. But in this moment, it's going to be our healthcare workers. It's our first responders. It's these unsung heroes potentially about to be sung but in the same vein that we're talking about how this is changing us, wouldn't this give us an opportunity to really think about what does it mean to be a leader, to be a hero, which is not the dapper business guy coming in with a slick suit telling everybody what to do, but it's really, it's servant leadership. It's, it's being of support to others. And, and I think, again, you know, we're getting a chance to watch this play out live right now. And so for me, you know, the TV bit around where everyone's sort of enjoying to see folks. I don't know if you saw Ryan Seacrest did one for the Disney Channel. And even Ryan in his kitchen did a really, you know, a better job than what he typically shows up. But he was still all prettied up with makeup. And I think, like, if we're being honest, we'd probably like to see the real Ryan Seacrest. Like, not that I'm like a huge fan and I, I dwell over this particular point, but you know, whenever you think about a behind the scenes tour, those tend to be the ones that people want to see because it's the real part. It's why reality television held promise for about a minute mm. until it became fake and scripted and back to using ploys as opposed to just using the real thing. So I, I think I, I'm, I'm in your camp. This, 
this is like a moment for authenticity. This is a moment for truth. This is a moment for all of us to step up into being, you know, just who we are. It's that, that, uh, that famous song from Nirvana, come as you are. Like that's to me the opportunity, which is just come as you are. And as you mentioned earlier, when people are invited to come as they are literally in how they're dressed, they bring their real gifts with them then because they're not, they're not pretending to be something else than they are in the rest of their lives. So they, they bring their, as you mentioned earlier, they, they bring the love that they have for their children to their work because they're not being asked to be different than who they are as, a, as an ordinary, as a, as a human being in the middle of their life. Let's talk a little bit more about leadership. You, you referred to this a, a, a little and it seems like in a vacuum of, in a vacuum of uncertainty that we're in right now, where we, we, know, we know the before, we know the during, but no one has a clear sense of what comes after this or what's coming next. In a vacuum of, in a vacuum of clear vision and leadership, the role of the leader changes. And I think you've got a little graph behind you that I'd love for you to unpack for us. But, um, you know, one, that there's, let me just jam on this for a second before you go into the, there's been a lot of um, narratives painted, multiple narratives painted in the last few weeks about what's going on and who you should listen to. Right. So the current administration has a narrative, which is sometimes is, is at odds with its own advisors. And then you've got scientists have got a narrative. And then I don't know if you ever noticed, but there's a, there's a whole undercurrent of kind of conspiracy theories narratives now about the, the, you know, all these dark forces. There are multiple narratives going on. And all of these narratives, well, at least, yeah, almost all of these narratives end up splintering into an us, the good people, and them, the bad people. And if you, if you simply look at it from that perspective and look at each narrative, it's always got a villain that we need to overthrow. And it's got us, the good, righteous people. You know, the, right. the, 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 the president's doing that. The people against the president are doing that. The conspiracy theorists are doing that. But actually what we're seeing at a, at a grassroots level in a company is in this vacuum of meaning, the leadership can actually be delegated out to the spokes of the wheel instead of staying at a, staying at a hub. So let's, let's jam a little bit on how the role of leadership uh, can be combined with people being more their real selves to actually, you could say, um, to crowdsource vision, to, cr to crowdsource direction and leadership to the entire organization? Well, I think you, the, as you're saying this, you and I, 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 I love the Wizard of Oz. And I think it's the best way to talk about this, which is, you know, Dorothy, you know, wakes up from this haze and this dream thinking that she needs someone else to fix her problems, right? And she meets along the way all these other characters who feel like they're missing something and they need to bring something from the outside to fill the hole in the soul on the inside. And I feel like you know, we're getting a chance to, again, sort of magnify that moment here right now where it's you know, asking everyone really tough questions like, what are we doing here, right? Does it really, is this really what life is about? And you know, I think in a lot of ways too, what this moment is creating is like a terminal illness for all of us mm. without the disease. Like we, we you know, again, you, know, you may or may not get COVID-19, you know, but the, but the idea that when you go through this, what you're trying to, what you're starting to see, and it's like the end of the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy said, holy crap, I had it within me the whole time as these vacuums of leadership continue. And that's really what you're talking about is we can't hear, you know, really any leadership right now talk about that there's one team. It's called Team Human. It's the same team. We're not actually going against each other. This COVID-19 virus can still bring us together, right? It can still bind us on the same side of the field, so to speak, but it's going to require, and you know, you and I have talked a lot about, you know, Ken Wilbur comes to mind here where, you know, to get out of these double binds, these two and, you know, twos and against the, the, the othering other people, you know, imagining that everyone is always a threat to you, you know, it really requires a different vantage point. It requires a different perspective. It requires you to sort of transcend what you thought yesterday was going to be to imagine a different future. And, you know, you, you, you did a great job with this with me like three weeks ago, which is we talked about, you know, does the, does the country need to go through a depression in order to be, to, to, to get through this? And I, and I was sort of of the mind of, I think it, it, it needs to go through something probably even harder to shake us off this tree or to pop our bubble. And, you know, you said 
but why? Like why, why if you know the stove is hot, why would you touch it anyway? Yeah. And I think this is the sort of the environment where as authority continues to find this, this moment of truth where people go, holy crap, you know, another movie reference. Remember Shawshank Redemption at the end of the movie, you know, and, and, and Morgan Freeman's character asks his, you know, store manager, hey, boss, can I, can I go use the restroom? The guy's like, why are you asking me to go to the bathroom all the time? He goes, because I've been in jail for 42 years and I've had to ask every single time, can I go to the bathroom? I think that's the moment we're in, which is, you know, maybe we should stop asking other people to fix our own problems. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, look to a health insurance company or a hospital to be, you know, really the arbiters of our health and our well-being. And it doesn't mean that we don't need support. It doesn't mean that we don't need community. It doesn't mean we don't need expert advice. It doesn't mean we don't need good coaching like you. But there's this fine line, this nexus, this void that you're talking about, which you know, Thomas Friedman spent a lot of time in his last book, <clears throat> Thank You for Being Late, um, basically overlaying two things. So we all know we've seen Moore's Law, this exponential curve <clears throat> of the accelerating returns of technology, that this is a doubling, that, that our heads as human beings, we don't double well. Can you just map the X and the Y of up for that so that, we, so that it makes sense? Yeah, so, so basically this is, this is um, the... Uh, computing power. This is sort of uh, distance. This is, um, and this is time. Okay. okay. And this is time. Okay. And so part of what you're seeing here is as technology increases up this exponential curve, there's another overlay of the adaptability of human beings, which is this linear path. And so another way to say this is if our phones are a million times faster, a thousand times cheaper than the computer that put Apollo 13 out into space and on the moon, then, then the human adaptability is like, how long does it take for everyone to use iPhones? How long did it take for humans to adapt to the radio, the TV, the internet, the technology? Well, what Thomas Friedman talked about was that this is the first time, and this was five or six years ago when the book came out, that this is the first time that human beings are building things that are faster. It's, ha it's our John Henry moment. We're building things that are actually becoming, yes, they're extensions and expressions of who we are, and they're a little out of control. We're, we're having this weird tug of war right now of like, who's in charge? Like, mm -hmm. is Facebook in charge? Mm -hmm. Or because we built Facebook, but at the same time, we're having a hard time getting off of Facebook. I mean, you know, no offense to Facebook Live here today. <laughs> so part of what Thomas Friedman talked about was, in order for us to get through this, we're gonna need something. We're gonna need a moment, a crisis. We're gonna need some challenge that's going to change the way, and you can sort of see my little dots here off the human adaptability. It's how do you change human nature? Because, I mean, fundamentally, that's what we're talking about, is how do we change our behaviors? How do we change collectively our mm. point of view? Mm. And you know, this moment, this again, I think it's, there's two things about this moment that I think are true. One, it is the, single biggest social experiment we've ever done to humanity where across 170 to 180 countries we're all experiencing pretty much the same thing and and it's a very short period of time but the second piece is and you know i i think this is also true which is yes there's gonna be death and destruction and my sister's a nurse and my brother's having a tough go right now and we've lost someone in the family to covid so this is not without holding space for that and this is the single greatest opportunity in business period because every industry is up for grabs. Every industry is trying to figure out where is the puck going. Mm. And part of what we can just maybe intuit at this point is that people are going to want more time with their family, maybe less time out and about. We can start to imagine that people um, have some type of uh, better govern on their distractions, maybe. Maybe. I mean, that's, that's the hope. That's the opportunity. Maybe, you know, I think long-term macro-wise, organizations are going to see that the, the, the bringing out the best in your people, building high-performing teams, really is this weird tug-of-war with agency. The more agency you give, the more trust you give. The more people feel trusted, the better work that they do. So it's a cause-cause relationship. And I think that if I'm running an organization, which you know we are, um, several of them, and helping other people sort of traverse this, 
It's like, let's give people their agency back. Let's treat people like adults. And let's try to do this adulting thing better in this next iteration. You, um, a few minutes ago, you referenced that you, you, you touched on the question of, is, is this what life is really about, right? right? And I think that's a beautiful question to bring to work, to the, to the world of work. You know, back in, uh, back in the early 2000s, when I, when I wrote The Translucent Revolution, uh, I, had a, a, I, I interviewed a bunch of business leaders, you know, and it's, it's amazing to think how much of our time, if you compute the time you spend at work, you don't really leave work during lunch, you know, and most people up until now have had a commute to and from work. And prior to leaving the house, you've got to prepare yourself and get dressed up in the kind of, you know, the uniform, whether that's a suit or a literally uniform. And then there's a decompression. And then you need the weekend also to decompress and need vacation. So really your entire life is dominated by work. And if your work sucks, or if your work is an outsourcing of your of your agency and your authority. If your work strips you of your creativity, then your life sucks. But if your work miraculously became a kindergarten for play, for, for creativity, for co-creating with others in a joyful, innocent way, then your life is beautiful. So when you're talking about teams and businesses and how to navigate this, it seems like it's partly a question of how to get through this, but it's also an opportunity to really ask that question more deeply about the world of work. Is this what life is really about? Do we really want to spend our lives in servitude to this kind of situation we've created where really nobody wins? You know, there's, no, there's no obvious whoopee winners in the way that we've created work so far. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 100%. And look, we've been you know, very, very, very focused on this particular problem for 20 years. And so it's not about giving you my resume, but 20 years ago, Gallup came out with a survey that is famously um, uh, named the Q12, asks 12 basic questions. It's, they've surveyed tens of millions of workers every single year for 20 years. And it comes back that 70% of the American workforce is not engaged. It, it takes a second to hear that because most people hear, oh, 70%. I'm like, no, no. 70% negatively are not engaged, meaning they don't even know what is expected of them at work. I mean, the first question of that survey is, do I know what is expected of me at work? And it's like, let me, so if you don't know the answer to that question, you're waiting for the organization to tell you. You've become a cog in somebody else's machine. Correct. And again, you know, I understand that some of those notions of authority were relevant for a very short period of time, but this is an opportunity to, as you say, you know, how you work will affect how you live because we spend so much of our time at work. And so that's really what I talked about in Shift the Work, which was this notion of like aligning your biology, that you have a head, a heart, a gut. These are brains in your body. And how would you design work, right? There, there's a great quote um, from Winston Churchill, which is like, we shape buildings, right? We're the architect of the building. But what's funny is the design of the building then shapes us. And it's the same thing with work, which is it's a cause, cause. We shape work and then work shapes us. So if you, at the end of the day, you are done with your business, you're done with your work, and you, you, are, you are making the long green, you know, taking the long trip upstairs or wherever your commute looks like these days, and you can't answer this one question, was today worth it? Mm. It's either a hell yeah, or I don't know. But, mm. but if it's not a hell yeah, like what a waste of a day. Mm. And it doesn't mean that it wasn't, you know, again, you're supposed to have these happy days with no hardships. But I think in some ways, this is our moment to mature, right? To go from like kind of a, a snot-nosed teenager who thinks they know everything to sort of stepping into our adolescence right now as a species to say, what are the things I should, I should really concern myself with? What are the things, am I playing a game that, I, that can be won? Or should I play a different game? Yeah. And right now with work, I think this is a tremendous opportunity. So there are different scales of that. You know, we, we can look at that personally. Um, how am I spending my life? How am I personally using my energy? And, and am, am, I, am I getting intrinsic value or extrinsic value? Am I, am I getting direct value from my experience? Or am I working hard so that later I'll have a boat, but I haven't really figured out if the boat is going to really make me as happy as I think. So that would be like one level. Another level that you've referred to now is within organizations, right? To, to make an organization coherent. But we can map that out to a bigger level, which is very relevant today, which is global. Because we have, there are multiple parameters. There have been 
They've been on the books since the 70s, but they're becoming more in focus now. Multiple parameters where for the first time in that we know of, we are actually jeopardizing our own future. We are, we are potentially putting ourselves and many other species, ex making ourselves and many other species extinct. And we've already made a number of species extinct directly through human intervention. Yeah. So this begs an even bigger question than how to make an organization coherent and how to get the best out of a team in a, in a working environment, which is how can we actually, how can we use this time of pandemic to really rethink the way that we're on the planet? which includes, you and I talked, I think it was just a couple of days ago, about not just that the world of work is incoherent, but the entire financial system. There's no winners in that either, right? The entire financial system, which works on, um, which works on debt. And uh, it, it, people in debt are not winners, but people who are owed money are equally not really winners either. You know, we, and we, we, can, we can explore that a little more if people are in doubt about that. But but the, the way that we've set up finance based on usury, which, by the way, used to be completely abhorrent to most of the kind of great religious traditions. Usury was, usury was outlawed in, within, also within the Christian church until the 17th century. Uh, and it's still outlawed in Islam for what it's worth. But, but we've created an entire financial system based on debt, uh, where now, you know, entire countries, including the U.S., are in a situation where there is no possible solution to the debt problem. I mean, the U.S. could never pay off. In, in a month of Sundays, the U.S. could never pay off the debt that it's got, let alone struggling third world countries. So you and I postulated the other day in one of our conversations, you know, we could just like that. In a day, we could just say all debt's forgiven. We're not going right. to do that right? We, we know we're not going to do that, at least not, not until things get more desperate. But if overnight we said, okay, all debt gone, I asked you the other day, I mean, would the world be a better or a worse place? And I, I won't put words in your mouth, you know, but it's an interesting question that, that this, this pandemic, which has been so disruptive, maybe not so much with the virus, but the reaction to the virus has been so disruptive. We're not just looking at shaking up how we do business within, a, within an organization. We're shaking up our entire presence on the planet, including potentially our environmental impact, some of which could be extremely positive. So let's, let's look at, let's expand the conversation to our, our sustainability as a species and as a planet. Well, I think one of the things that I loved about that conversation is, what we're also not, I don't think, adding to the conversation when you see it in the media or even other experts is that, the, the, the population is aging and that we have five generations in the workplace for the first time ever. And so it's, it's like having, you know, if we have a hard time with the three major religions and all these other sort of versions of faith, now we have five big versions of what people think are important based on their generational upbringing. And so in business, you know, we've seen millennials be a little bit more in touch with this progressive direction of thinking about you know, uh, big issues like quality or climate change or just them voting with their values. Very similar to what my generation, Generation X did, which is we're sort of in between the, the traditionals, the baby boomers. And, and I think we were the, the beginning of the, the rebel, if you will, of like not really wanting to listen to what dad said. And so I think if you bubble up kind of, you know, this moment, most of the narratives given around authority are that age and title and tenure, you know, those are the most important things. And I think what we're starting to feel and see is this, this tension between kind of an old way of doing things and a new way of doing things. Like, how many millennials want to get into coal? Like, how many millennials think it's a good idea to um, keep making as many cars uh, with a combustible engine? Like, no, right. no, one, no one's saying that, right? The, these these again, How many millennials are creating new varieties of tobacco product or alcohol? Right. Right. And, and again, you know, what, what I think we have to do is acknowledge that in the same way we all have music that we love, that was most closely connected to your, your growing up emotionally when songs resonated with you. And then all of a sudden that song becomes a fixed part of your history, becomes a fixed part of your identity. Well, we've got to find a way to begin to detach our identity from these experiences and from these ideas, because 
you know, again, I'm, I'm all movie reference, which I'm typically not, but you know, I'm, I'm reminded of like Rocky five <laughs> okay. where it was not his time to fight anymore. And it was his time to teach and train, you know, the, the, the young fighter. And I think part of our generation's opportunity is, is to not step aside in it so much as it is to step and like make the circle bigger of people that we're going to think about, that we're going to collaborate with, that we're going to consult with before decisions get made. So, you know, look, I think the, the, the opportunity right now on a global level is to take this and, and to really, again, figure out some big questions and, and, and to, to let math and the bouncing ball of like, how do we want life to be? I mean, you and I talked about this the other day. It's like at the end of your life, we know that 75 percent of the medical spend on every person's life in this country is done in the six weeks right before they pass. You know, this notion of extending life. Yeah, yeah. Is that is is that like we have all of us now have family in nursing communities where they can't see us right before they pass? Like, is that winning? Interesting that we do exactly the opposite with the 2.3 other million species on the planet, right? We, <laughs> we try to preserve life at all costs you know, with our own species, but we don't extend that to others. We, yeah. put, them out, we put them out of their misery, right? That, yeah. but, but again, you know, we have a hard time with this temporal impermanence, this, you know, this notion of what's next. And look, that's, that's a whole other conversation and a rabbit hole for another day. But I think at a very cursory level, if we just said, whatever this, this experience is that we're all having right now, like listening to me talk or you talk or just hear, you know, this is not going to last forever. And right. so, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, a mutual friend of ours, Yannick Silver talks a lot about, which is, you know, a good way to think about decisions is like, if you were 111 years old, what would you want that 111 year old self to, what do you think the advice would be that they'd be giving to you now? And I think, you know, when you think in multi-generations, you know, this notion that I, my kids are going to have kids and their kids are going to have kids and they're going to have a record of history that had never been existed before. Like they're going to listen to this potentially. I, bet, I hope it, I hope it really, I hope it counts. I hope they're proud. I hope they think about how much we really were thinking about them, not just us. Let's return for a moment to the notion, just maybe to finish our conversation today, let's, let's return to the notion of outsourcing. Yeah. And you've, you've had some really, you've, you've lit me up with, normally we talk about outsourcing where you send, you know, a, you, you create a call center in Mumbai instead of in, uh, instead of in San Jose and you've saved some money. But you've talked about outsourcing, outsourcing meaning outsourcing authority, outsourcing your well-being, outsourcing your self-care, your, your, your health, and outsourcing your retirement, and ultimately outsourcing why you live your life. Right. So, and I think that's very tied to the recreation of a new future, that when we outsource, we become dependent upon singular individuals or singular groups, usually who are highly unqualified for the job, you know? I, I've kind of made the decision to disaffiliate from any political party. You know, I, I'm going to, in future, I'm going to seek out qualified independent candidates to vote for, right? Um, I, I have the privilege of doing that in California because the, 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 party, the party swings a foregone conclusion. But, but wouldn't it be amazing, you know, if we, sh if we could shift our whole political structure to every candidate was independent and so stood for their own values instead of having to instead of having to be herded into a sort of value clumping where people have to clump all kinds of values together. But equally, if we all became, if we all stopped outsourcing, two things would happen. First, we would stop pointing fingers because we would realize the problem is not, some people think the problem is Trump. Some people think the problem is now Tony Fauci. Some people the problem think the problem is Bill Gates, you know, et cetera. But really the problem may be us you know, uh, and no one of us any more than any other of us. And we right. discover that when we stop outs outsourcing, when we actually take authority, when each of us takes authority for the quality of the impact we're each having, if everybody did that, we would have a green forest. You know, we would, in, it, you, you know what I mean? If, if everybody took responsibility to be a green tree, we would have a green forest. But this, this would take a way more dramatic upgrade than throwing out 
an undesirable leader and replacing that leader with a better leader. This would require a, a thorough, a thorough system-wide upgrade of the operating system, but it's maybe our only hope. So let's talk about, let's talk about the tendency to outsource and what we, can, what we can most rapidly do to support people to stop outsourcing, which means to stop blaming as well as looking for leadership. Well, you said, I mean, we talked about this a little bit already, which is the notion that our brains are wired to protect us from threats. Mm. And when we see someone who doesn't look like us, doesn't, doesn't sound like us, doesn't make us feel like we're part of a club or a tribe, our brain goes into this fight, flight, or freeze, you know, the old reptilian brain. And so we, you know, we, our biology is a little wired for the othering that we do with each other. But, you know, there, if you really look at history, I mean, the United States has not really been invaded here in quite some time. And it doesn't mean that there aren't issues, but the, the notion that we're not even able in this moment to look at, it, at each other to say we're all on the same team. We're all brothers and sisters. We all have common ancestors. We all have shared experiences. We all have different experiences. We're all diverse. Um, I think, you know, this is the growing up that, you know, you and I are, you know, inviting, helping to facilitate, helping to lead folks right now. And, and, and again, think about even where we get our language from. Right? We know 40,000 years ago, our ancestors were sitting in caves for the first time drawing to one another to, to just pass on stories of meaning, to pass on shared uh, experiences or, or, again, sort of you know, ways to survive longer. And, and the more that we are, again, transposing these ideas, these actions, and, and then eventually, to your point, services and goods, without understanding how they happen, you know, ways is amazing. But Waze makes me lazy. I don't know how to read a map anymore. And, you know, is that good or is that really the spice of life? And I think mm -hmm. this is the tug of war that Thomas Friedman was talking about, which was, you know, is technology making us dumber mm. or smarter? Mm. And, and, and again, there's probably uses, you know, again, um, we did a conference last year called Complicated Conversations. We had Stephen Kotler and Richard Saul Werman come. It was a conference about life and death. And I remember one of the things that Richard said in that meeting, he said, you know, we have Tinder and Facebook sitting on our iPhones instead of the library of Alexandria. <laughs> we, we could have also done that. We, mm -hmm. we could also have, I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to just be to distract us, to entertain us. It could be to enrich us if we wanted that. But again, reading something, transposing someone else's ideas onto us. I think the thing that we know about adult learning, we know about evolution which is we learn best through direct experience. And so think about even uh, you, uh, <laughs> I climbed Kilimanjaro, okay? Yay for Joe. And I was with a friend of mine a couple years ago and he was like, so tell me where you've traveled. Tell me what you've done. I said, well, I, I climbed Kilimanjaro. He goes, great, how many porters did you have? I said, well, it was a group of 10 of us. We took 40 porters. And he's like, so let me get this straight. Four human beings to one to get you up a mountain. <laughs> now, as I'm sort of, you know, having my mini confessional here, I, I got to thinking about it. I'm like, look, yes, it was my first time camping. I, I, I'm a city mouse. I don't even know what the country's like. So, I mean, that's a whole other story for another day. But think about it. That whole experience was filtered. It was caged with a bubble of protection. Right. As opposed to a uncaged, unfiltered experience, which... Rather Mayor like a Hyatt in Mexico, you know, like a Hyatt Regency in Mexico. Right. It's not yeah. really in Mexico. It's a bit of America that's been moved into Mexico. Exactly. Exactly. And so to me, one of the things that we're going to continue to find is like, uh, you know, I outsourced, we had a handyman fixing the house for a long time. Well, we haven't had him to come in here. So I've had to learn those things myself. Hey, Joe. <laughs> now, frankly, I have no interest in doing that moving forward, but <laughs> it's probably been healthy for me to understand how to put light bulbs in the ceiling. Again. <laughs> okay. So let's, let's wind things up. Um, I want to come just finish up with a little bit coming back to the before, during, after. Yep. And then let's also let people know about what, what Shift does and how I've, I've seen we've got, I can see some of the people online and some of the people who are listening to this may very well be interested in, in, in working with your organization. So in terms of before, during, after, I mean, we can look historically the First World War, for example, was 
devastating. I mean, incredible, not just loss of life, but really brutal loss of life. But unbelievable good things came out of the First World War. To start with, the, the First World War was, was so cav, 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 cavalry-centric. There, was no tech, there wasn't very little technology in warfare at that time. It required lots of people. So women were left to run the factories and run, and, and, and run everything at home. That empowerment of women that was, a, that was, an, that was an indirect result of, of the war actually propelled the, the suffragette movement, uh, the emancipation of women, you know, getting the vote, and, and of course has, has precipitated a whole infusion of feminine wisdom into the culture ever since. There are multiple benefits we got from both wars, although they were devastating and you would say you don't want them, there was indirect benefit, including just a second example is out of the Great Depression, you know, which was a terrible time, people died of starvation in, in developed countries, out of the Great Depression emerged kind of mass marketing and mass retailing, which made retailing way more efficient. Now, the people who could see that in England, that was the Woolworth company. You know, Woolworths who could see, wow, we don't have to have every transaction overseen by a shopkeeper. People can go and select what they want and then go to a cash register. That was completely revolution. Only the Great Depression could have precipitated that, right? right. So people right. Who, who could actually surf waves of calamity and see the direction they're going, firstly, they made money. Secondly, they develop lives of leadership and meaning, but thirdly, they could propel evolution, which is probably the most, the most fulfilling use of your life is to be an agent of evolution. So based on where, where we can see ourselves re-emerging now, where would you say are some of the evolutionary directions we're going to be moving as we start to not go back to work, but go forward into a new, a new world that comes after the pandemic? Yeah, you bet. You bet. Well, I think one of the things that we're seeing is that People like being home. And I don't think that you're going to have an easy time putting people back into these fake offices. Um, I think you're also going to have a hard time even thinking about time with work. And so right now we're seeing organizations play around with the notion of nine to five, you know, maybe moving to a six hour work day or a four day work week where we're starting to give people back their time, their agency. And, mm -hmm. and again, it's sort of a win-win for the organization because if they're needing to cut because we're in this contraction condition, then this gives sort of, again, the ability for all of us to sort of kind of size up and create a new set point together. And so that's, those are just a couple of things. I think the other, the other big thing that we're seeing right now from a business standpoint is, you know, when you think about the way our economy is built, it's built for growth growth on top of growth, debt on top of debt. And, you know, big companies, you know, like Uber and others who, you know, have a series of expectations that will not be met now. You know, what does an organization like that do when, you know, they're losing billions of dollars a quarter and they're trying to think about, you know, what the world looks like when we reopen. And I think what you're going to see is, you know, again, a continuation of um, how do we burn down the things we don't need? And that's really what Airbnb and Uber did in 2008, they said, gosh, look at all these assets, mm. homes and cars that are not mm. being used all the time. Mm. How do we reuse those? So it's almost like a regenerative economy mm. Mm -hmm. where we're going to be maybe recycling things that already exist. Mm. That's number one. But number two, I think, you know, you've seen this, which is a bit of a craft movement. Like I want to build an app or I want to brew my own beer or I want to make my own vegetables at the house. Like there's probably going to be a resurgence of taking this you know, super duper interconnected world economy, global economy, but maybe trying to maybe think about how do you shorten your cycle, your, your supply chain cycle of how you get things, about how you order things, about making sure the things that you get are the things that you really want, right? As opposed to, you know, listening to the 3000 ads a day telling you what you're not enough of and, and what you should be insecure of. So, I mean, ultimately, big picture, you know, things like, 401k plans, um, notions of what retirement is and healthcare. I mean, I think one of the biggest things that we should see out of this is for six weeks, unless you had heart attack, unless you had a major critical issue or you had COVID, we've had six weeks of people not visiting the hospital for just silly reasons. Mm. Well, so, we've also just... yeah. 
just to balance that out, we've also unfortunately had a lot of people not going to the hospital for good reasons, and Correct. which means that other conditions other than COVID have not been adequately addressed. Correct. And, and again, but to me, it's like, it, it's like if, you've, if everyone can remember when they were a kid, the first time you lost your parents, hmm. right? You, you, I remember being in a store and I lost my dad. And, you know, the, the, the immediate feeling of terror, right, and fear, remembering the Adam movie, right, where the kid got picked up in a store and he, you know, and he was never found again. But the more that time goes on, the more that you build your confidence, the more that you build your presence, the more that you find your pattern of learning, of going from what was not known to known. Yeah. That's, to me, the moment that we're finding ourselves in right now. So, again, you know, if we can evaporate the bullshit, all the things that we know are just low hanging fruit. And I think we've talked about some of those things today. We will absolutely have different and, and, and frankly, better emergent values out of this. What would be your takeaways for business owners listening to this? People who maybe have employees, um, people who want to continue, but are also willing to adapt. What are some, what are some key what are some key attributes or key habits that we need to keep in mind? Well, I think I've talked a lot about this. You know, in the last six weeks, we've, we've stood up a bunch of webinars for our community. And, you know, the first thing we tell people is tell them the truth. I mean, right now, tell them your vulnerabilities. Tell them, you know, what you can do and can't do. And part of the truth is to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If this is, in fact, an unprecedented time, what it means is there's not precedent. There's not history. There's not a map for it from the past. And so mm. just being very honest about that, you know, I think leaders in this moment will create an amazing amount of collaboration and cooperation if they can just be honest. So saying things like, I don't know, could be the three most powerful words any leader says. Yeah. Because as we talked about that vacuum of, of leadership, what happens is whenever there's a vacuum, it gets filled. Yeah. And, and your team will fill it with ideas. They'll fill it with innovation. They'll fill it with their own leadership. So that's, that's just the first piece. The second is I think you have to continue to find the beauty and the bright spots and the hope. And so as much as the truth is an important feature and factor of how people will receive you. I think really finding the hope. And so one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing is, and right now we're doing a, a massive um, uh, research project on how people have been experiencing work. And so we've created a work from home survey. We've been doing surveys now for 20 years. And what we do with this information is we're gathering it to keep a record of what did work because we have a funny memory. We will forget why it was easier to work from home, why you might have been more productive. And so gathering this information right now, and again, this is a free survey, so if anybody wants to check it out, um, you can go to our website um, uh, while we're sort of offering this, this, this instrument. But what I would say is, you know, being a really good listener, and, and then the final thing, you know, tell the truth, find some hope is, you know, this is a time to really double down on each other. This is a time to fight this fear virus that we're dealing with, with goodwill with good hearts, with, with good moments. And part of that is, you know, finding a way to treat each other, just like every major religion, every person who gets to the end of their life says, it's all about heart, it's all about relationships. It's, it's you know, the one thing that we know, you can't take your money with you, you can't take these things with you, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. But what you can take with you is this, again, this feeling of peace and contentment and love. Like, we know that's not fake. We know that's- Having made a contribution. And ha yeah. ha having been a servant of evolution. Yeah. yeah. Um, Joe, how can people who, by the way, anyone, while I'm asking Joe this last question briefly, anyone who'd like to ask Joe anything, just type it into the comments box. I've got it up on my screen and I'd be glad to I see a lot of, a lot of appreciation here. Thank you, Penny. Yeah. Thank you, Kari. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of appreciative comments. If you want to ask anything, just go ahead and type it in. Um, Joe, if, if people would like to work with you or work with Shift, people who have organizations that like support in, in moving through this time, how do people, how could somebody initiate a relationship with, with Shift? Well, I would say, you know, you can easily send me an email at joe at shifttheworkcom or go to our website, shifttheworkcom um, right. I'm always happy to have uh, quick conversations. We've been doing a lot of virtual meetups. 
uh, where we're putting uh, multiple people together just to get to know each other and to form different connections and community right now. So there's no strings. We're not, we're not trying to uh, do some fancy business here with marketing and sales. But if you have an organization that's north of a few million dollars of annual revenue, um, you know, we have a, a large amount of experience. I'm joined by 25 amazing human beings at Shift. Um, we have, uh, you know, a really good point of view about being a startup. We have a, a really good point of view about being a growth company and that kind of couple million trying to get to a hundred million. And then the last six years, we spent a lot of time, 70% of our time in organizations that are a billion dollars plus. Mm -hmm. And so we've got this interesting spectrum of experience and point of view. And so I would just say, you know, check us out on the web. Uh, you know, we've written a couple books that are good. Um, and we can go from there. I have another one coming soon, right? We might have another one coming soon, yeah. Great, man. Help thanks. my friend, Arjuna. <laughs> thanks so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. I've put the link to Shift. Hi, Cynthia. Uh, I put, I've put um, the link to the website on the live feed. And um, make sure you read kind of Joe to give us his personal email. Thanks a lot, Joe, for, for being here. And uh, we'll talk again soon, brother. Well, I hope you found that conversation with Joe interesting, useful, stimulating, and I hope it will give you an opportunity to see how, whether it's the COVID pandemic or any other kind of challenge in your business and professional life, can also become an opportunity for something even better. So, as always, at the end of each of these podcasts, I like to leave you with something practical, something you can use as an exercise or a practice, for the, at least for the rest of this day. And here comes something exactly like that with this podcast. I'm going to ask you to take a few minutes and take your journal and a nice pen and uh, think about some of the ways that you have been negatively impacted, either by the lockdown and the pandemic or ways that you've been negatively impacted by something else. And so we want to start by getting on paper at least five ways that you feel that things have become more difficult for you. And then we're going to shift over and we're going to simply put this little prompt. We're going to write, this is the best thing that could have happened because, and then complete the prompt five times. So I'll give you an example. You might say the pandemic is been is difficult because uh, I've lost customers the pandemic is difficult because um, we've lost money the pandemic is difficult because I've had to lay off employees and then we then you the next part you would say this is the best thing that could have happened because it's forced me to reconsider what our business is about and to redefine our values this is the best thing that could have happened because it's woken me up to creating new employment opportunities for my community and so on, right? And then the last part of this journaling exercise I'd like to invite you to is to contemplate action steps based upon how this, how you can see this is the best thing that could have happened. Contemplate some action steps that you could bring into your day and your weeks ahead. Things that you could be doing differently to ride a wave of opportunity instead of feeling uh, deflated or held up by unexpected disruption. We've got some great new episodes coming up for you, and I look forward to seeing you and dialoguing with you soon. You can go to RadicalBrilliance.com where this podcast is broadcast, and you can put your comments there, or you can join us on the Radical Brilliance page on Facebook. See you soon.